I would love to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, um, Mr. Jeff Shadrick. I've known Jeff for quite some time. First time I ever, this might take a second. Because <laughs> I want to tell a story. Uh, you can stand up, it might be a couple minutes. I want to tell a story. Jeff, um, the first time I ever met Jeff was at another one of the, the groups in town. And the first time I ever met him, I, I didn't know who he was. He didn't know who I was. And I was a brand new wholesaler. And, and if you can relate, maybe some of the seasoned investors that are in here, you know, you can, is it anyone who's been investing for a while? Have you ever had that first awkward conversation with a wholesaler? Do you know how that first awkward conversation usually goes? Hey, hey, Mr. Investor, I'm buying houses or I'm wholesaling houses. Where do you like to buy? Is anyone ever, am I the only one that's had these conversations? <laughs> I'm the only one. These awkward, awkward, ridiculous conversations that I now get, I know exactly how he felt. And this is how I approached him. And now I've kind of learned that that's not really the way you want to approach an investor. If you're a wholesaler, you need to approach them with, with kind of a value add. Again, here's that word. Um, what can you do for them, right? Approach it from that angle. That's the first time I ever um, got into contact with Jeff. Um, since then, um, especially the last year, year and a half that, you know, since Alaria has started, um, Jeff and his partner, Jonathan Mednick, who's, who's in the crowd in the back, um, they have been an integral part of this group. And not only from obviously, you know, just talking to them and get in, and, you know, understanding the market from their point of view so I can better serve you guys. But really we took it to the next level recently in the, in the last, you know, four or five months where we started, you know, I talked about earlier these mastermind groups. Jonathan, Jeff, and then I know most of you guys know Matthew Gregory. We started a mastermind group with some of the, you know, obviously the bigger um, real estate investors in town. And if you are doing business and you're doing 10, 12, 15 deals a year and you're ready to just absolutely explode your business, you're going to see very, very clearly why after you get done listening to Jeff, you're going to see it's going to be pretty clear that you need to get in this room with these people and these minds, these people that have been doing this for a long time, doing you know, literally a hundred deals a year plus, which I know Jeff is going to talk about here in a second. So with all that being said, um, Jeff and Jonathan, REI Trader, what they do for us is just been, it's just above and beyond. We're very grateful for them. So I would love for everybody in this room to get up on your feet and welcome to the front of the room, Mr. Jeff Shadrick. Uh, situated here for just one second. I can't walk around stuff in my hands. I like to wave. <clears throat> um, thanks, Brian, for inviting me in. Um, hope you guys get some value out of this. Um, yeah. so we'll go. Just a little bit of background uh, about myself. Um, born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama, just about an hour south of here. Uh, graduated from the University of Alabama with a degree in finance, roll tide. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I'd spark a little bit of interest in that. Um, moved to Birmingham in 1999 uh, after uh, finishing up school. Uh, spent 18 years working in the personal and corporate finance industry. Um, one day just decided to uh, either take a gun out of the closet and shoot myself or get out of the personal finance industry. So um, in those over 13 of those 18 years, I spent most of that uh, doing my own investments, buying houses, uh, spec houses, building new construction, uh, uh, fixing and flipping and buying rental properties myself. Uh, really is more as a part-time gig. Um, in 2005, I got my, uh, my builder's license and started building on a more consistent basis. And then guess what happened in 2007? <laughs> Market crashed. Uh, nobody was building houses anymore. And um, I can tell you there was one of those phone calls where I used to call the bank and say, hey, uh, you know, I got this new project over in Chelsea and I'm gonna do, I need $400,000. And they'd say, yeah, just come by and sign the paperwork next week, no problem, be in the account tomorrow. So I called up my bank, I was like, damn, I got this great deal, man. Look me up. He's like, dude, there's no money. I was like, what do you mean there's no money? I've never faulted on a deal, never done anything that bad with it. It's like, fuck, there's no money. So overnight, it was just done. 
lived through all of that, um, was able to get through the spec deals that we had, came out, uh, sold the properties that we had on the books at the time. Um, but it really got me to thinking about, you know, what's the, what's the foolproof? You know, if this, when this happens again, how do you want to set your business up going forward so that you don't repeat these same mistakes? And so um, what I started doing was looking at doing an all-encompassing business that allowed me to take advantage of any type of market. So what we've tried to build over the last few years is a, is a business that it really doesn't matter if the market's here or if it's here, we're gonna capitalize and we can turn the switches in the business to make it do that. So I say that just to really um, advise you if you're in real estate, just getting started and you're trying to figure out what you're gonna do or you're seasoned and you're just you know running everything at one level speed, take a step back in your business and look at it and ask those questions. You know, what happens if tomorrow it all falls apart? How can I shift gears? How can I set my business up to where it will actually continue to, no matter what the market's doing? Um, all right, I went full-time into contracting 2000 uh, and, and in real estate investment in 2010. I'll tell you how that went over. So I'm in the bank one day doing all this stuff. I was like, man, I just, I just don't want to do this anymore. Got a call from a guy who said, uh, hey, um, said, I got these properties you want to go look at, do some investing. I was like, all right, I can do that, you know. So um, I went in, I talked to my manager. I was like, I need, I need to take tomorrow off. I was like, I gotta go check out some stuff. I think she knew what was going on. So she came, she's like, well, you know, you got a job to do here. And I said, man, I don't wanna do this job anymore. And I walked out. <laughs> and so um, I got home, I was newly married. <laughs> I had two kids, newborns. Um, my wife didn't work. And so overnight, we were both unemployed, we had no income. So uh, you can pretty much imagine how that conversation went over when we got home. But luckily I have a great wife and she turned around and she said, you know what, I trust you, go do it. And so that's what we did. Um, we turned around and, uh, and that's when we built the turnkey model and uh, it started going. At the time, you know, the market was depressed. So the only thing you could find, you could buy these houses for dirt cheap. And so you go out, you buy them. I mean, it's like cherry picking. And then you, go, you just pick a pull up the MLS in the morning and you go, I want that one, I'll take that one, I'll take that one too. You know, and you buy them ten, fifteen thousand dollars. You put ten, fifteen thousand in them. You turn around and sell them for three times that. It was great. Um, hindsight, what I should have done is kept every single one of those properties because um, we'd be a lot different situation right now. Um, built over three hundred and fifty plus. I don't know. I lost count after a while, um, but just consistently started to fine tune and build the business and move on. Um, in 2015, uh, I decided, okay, it's time to really kind of implement that model that I, that I talked about earlier, which was how to build the business that can operate in any environment. Um, ran into, at a local RIA, uh, mixer, at a mixer uh, ran into Jonathan uh, Medic, and he was, uh, Tell me he was a broker here in town and, uh, and part of the model that we wanted to build out was to have in-house brokerage and kind of run everything in-house. And so uh, I talked to Jonathan, I said, hey Jonathan, let's go, let's go grab some lunch. So we did that, we met, we talked and uh, had some congruency in what we wanted to do. And he said, man, all that sounds great. He said, but, uh, but I'm moving to Nashville. And I said, no you're not. I said, you're staying here. I said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it right. So, he canceled. I think you already have. Didn't, didn't you already have a uh, house or a, an apartment ready to rent or something? Yeah. Anyway, I was like, look, cancel all that. You're coming to work here. So this is what he did. We brought it all in. So what we now have is we have REI Trader LLC. Uh, it is a full service investment company which handles construction, uh, real estate investment sales, holding, and uh, as well as we have the brokerage side in, which can help from the real estate agent. So if you think about that. You look at the model, basically what it does is it gives you the opportunity to capitalize on every single cash flow avenue within the real estate industry. So we can make money on the front end when we buy them, we can make money when we renovate them, we can make money when we sell them. So it's it just all of those wheels, they all work together, they all support each line of business. And at the end of the day, if something shifts in the market, we take a look at which one is, has the more capacity and we shift our resources to that side. Um, right now, our primary focus is on buying portfolio rentals uh, first. We kind of put them in an order, so we look at the property and we go, does it make sense for the company? If it does, it goes in that bucket. 
if it uh, if it doesn't make sense for us, but we know there's still uh, meat on the bone and we can make profit off of it, then we take it in, we rehab it, we put a tenant in, get it, get it performing cash flowing, and we sell it out to our buyers uh, across the U.S. wherever they are. Um, and then of course our retail flips are this where we get those deals in where we want to take take advantage of a deal in uh, some of the higher end markets that uh, that makes sense for us to flip and hit our profit margins. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go over an enormous amount of stuff here. This is about three to four days worth of training that I've crammed into um, this presentation. So I'm going to go really quick. Um, I probably won't be able to hit everything, but at the end of this, I know everybody's going to have questions, so obviously I'll, I'll uh, answer questions at the end. And then, um, and then if you want a copy of this presentation at the end, then send me an email. You'll send me, my, send me your information. I'll get you a copy so you can go back and look at it. Fair enough? Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to start off with the front end, which is going to be the inspection process. Let me do a, a query of the room here. I know Brian asked this a minute ago. Who's wholesaling? Okay. Who's, who's rehab? Okay. Good mix. Good half and half. Okay, good. It doesn't matter whether you're wholesaling or you're a rehabber. These steps that I'm going to go over on the front end here are really, from a wholesaler's perspective, are going to give you the ability to walk into a property and know what types of items to look at and address so that you can add value to your person that's going to be buying that property from you on the other end for the rehab. One of the biggest things as a rehabber that you struggle with is you get people calling you all the time and they say, I've got this great deal. And they send it to you and they go, man, it needs like $5,000 worth of work. And then you walk into the property and it's like almost a teardown. You're like, okay, what's going on here? All that is is just education. And it's just, if you're going to be the best that you're going to be in your profession, which is what most of you strive to do, is do the extra piece. Go one step further than the next guy and make sure that you can give them the data that they need. Because there's a lot of times where a deal for a rehabber just may not be for that person. And if they know it on the front end, they can say, look, man, it's just not for me. Or they might just say, man, that's it. I got it. It just saves time and effort in the process. And it shows the person that you're selling the property to that you've taken the extra amount of time to, and you value their time on the, on the front end. Um, this will go a long way to helping you. If you're a rehabber, then hopefully what this does is helps you kind of fine tune, especially for some of the newer folks. It helps kind of drive home some of the areas that you know you need to focus on when you go in, you're doing your initial investment reviews and calculating some of your numbers. Now, disclaimer, these are averages on the, when I get into the numbers section, these are, these are numbers that have been kind of accumulated over time, they're averages. You know, there are a million different ways that you can calculate numbers and it all depends on, you know, whether you're hiring a GC outright to do your, your rehab for you or whether you're doing it in-house and you're gonna sub it all out. You know, all of that's going to have an effect on your, what your uh, overall costs are going to be. So what I've tried to do is put some numbers together that will actually guide you and help you get some normals so that you can get your front end numbers. And then once you obviously get it under contract, you can go ahead and true it all up and hopefully you're within a certain margin to, uh, to make the numbers work. Um, all right, so must do's. When you go to a property to, to look at, take as many pictures as you possibly can while walking through that property. I mean, we take a minimum of 75 to 100 pictures on every property. Uh, that's on the low end. And the reason that you do that is because when you leave that house, it's usually kind of your last shot when you're there to kind of go through and determine what you're going to do. You're not really going to go back. There's not enough time. You know, they've got either other buyers or they've got, you know, they've got a time frame they've got to hit. So you need to kind of know those things on the front end. And what happens when you get back to your office or you get back to your house and you start crunching numbers, you're like, man, did that thing have like a chandelier or did it have like, what? You don't know that. You can go back to the pictures and it's a lot easier for you to kind of help true up your numbers when you're doing that. So take as many pictures as you can. All exterior services, anything that obviously jumps out at you, as a uh, as a problem, something that needs to be addressed. Uh, take those pictures. I typically, when I'm taking pictures, I'll put my back in the corner of every single room, and I'll take a picture of like every. I'll just basically do almost like a 360 
Uh, and we haven't gotten sophisticated enough to where I've actually bought the 360 camera to do that, but that's next. Um, so make sure you take a bunch of pictures. Uh, measurements, take sure, make sure you take measurements of the things that you need so that when you get back, you can do your calculations appropriately. If you don't know how many square feet you got in a bedroom, how are you gonna figure out how much floor you need? How much paint you're gonna need? You know, how are you gonna know that stuff? You don't know how many doors are in there. You know, those things all add up. You gotta address every single one of those. So make sure that the key factors like room square feet, uh, cabinet and countertop linear feet, um, number of lights, plugs, switches, count all that stuff. You know, it's, it's a whole, if you're a wholesaler and you're coming to me trying to send me a property and you go, man, this thing's got like 35 plugs and switches that need to be replaced. And you lay out all this stuff, man, I'm gonna be like, this dude's got his game on. He knows what's going on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little bit more value and I'm gonna take your numbers a little bit more to heart. I'm not still gonna check the numbers, but it's gonna make it easier and I'm gonna be more inclined to do business with you. Um, the last one, <clears throat> get dirty folks. You gotta get down, you gotta look deep. Don't just look at what's on the surface. Go in the crawl space, go in the attics, go in the basements. You know, if you gotta put a jumpsuit on, get it on. I mean, that's just the way you gotta be on these because what's gonna happen is if you don't, nine times out of 10 is gonna be that unforeseen. And here's, as a wholesaler, your, your value to the, to the person you're selling to is, I've kinda seen all those things and you're not gonna have any surprises. You're not gonna find out that the AC's bunk. You're not gonna find out that there's a structural issue that you need to address and it's gonna blow the guy's budget out because guess what they'll remember that on the next one so just kind of take that deep, deeper step to go in um, okay so things that these are just some bullet point items that we look at when we go through a renovation and we determine whether or not um, you know what needs to be fixed or not so we always start on the outside I always look at you know it's the easiest place to start you just start on the outside and you look at the roof what's the condition of the roof does it need to be replaced Got a few more years. Um, let me throw another little disclaimer out here too. If you're new in this business, you're not gonna know how old a roof is when you go out there. You're not gonna know that this is a 10 year roof and it's probably got 10 years left or what, all that. That's, it's fine, just do your best guess at it and look at it. If it's got chalking on it, you know it's probably a good idea. It's gonna be replaced. I mean, it's curling up, got those nail pops and stuff like that. Just, those are things that you'll pick up and do more and more. So as you go out, I used to go out and actually, whether I was gonna buy the house or not, I just go out and walk through the houses. And just so that I just repeat and repeat and repeat and know that, okay, I've seen this house and I compare it to the last house I saw and that was a good roof or this was a bad roof or that. Just, it's, rep it's repetition, just like anything in life, the more you do it, the more you're gonna pick it up. Uh, number of shingles. You know, there's some calculations, some quick and dirty calculations you can do to figure out how many bundles of shingles you're gonna need on that roof to be able to estimate how much it's gonna do, uh, take. Uh, eaves, cornice, fascia, look at those things, make sure there's no rot in the fascia, uh, or if there is, how many linear feet of that is that you're gonna have to, uh, to replace. Um, is it gotta be painted, those types of things. Uh, exterior walls and sheathing, is it brick? Is it um, uh, vinyl siding? Is it lap siding? Is it uh, shingles? I mean, you just note those things so that when you're back in your office and you're going through all that, you can kind of help come up with uh, that. And hopefully you've taken enough pictures, you can refer back to those. Uh, gutters and downspouts, do they need to be replaced fully? Are they, can they be repaired? Uh, foundation walls, this is one that trips up a lot of people a lot of times, you know, they just, they don't put enough weight into what a foundation means and the, and the overall cost of a foundation repair. And so they'll, they'll throw these out, oh, it's got, it's got a little crack in the foundation. There's a reason it's got a crack in the foundation. What's that reason? You wanna know uh, what it's gonna be because it could be a $500 fix and it could be a $25,000 fix. You just don't know until you really kind of find out what the root cause is on that. Um, and if you have a question, don't be afraid to call an expert. I mean, call, call a foundation guy. You know, call somebody to come out there with you and take a look at it. If you're talking to the seller, you say, hey, you know, look, I, I, this is a bargaining point for you. I mean, hey, you got a crack in your foundation right here. I really need to get somebody in here that can help me assess what's going on. When I do that, I, then I can come back and give you more of an accurate estimation of what I can pay for your house. That's a, that's a 
win for you because now you know you've got negotiating power in, in, uh, in discussing with that seller. Uh, painting, um, you know, how, what do we need to paint on the outside? How much paint do we need? Does it, is it flaking? Can it just be painted? Do we need to pressure wash and, uh, and repaint? Walls, foundations, eaves, windows, doors. Now, my whole point here is really you want to get into the mindset of what is what are those things that I can possibly have or can possibly cost me money as I'm as I'm renovating this property. Um, decks, porches, patios, and handrails. You want to review. You know what's the total square footage of those. You're going to need to know that so that we go to figure out what your costs are on the replacement of those. Uh, you can figure that out. Uh, figure out the materials list and go through that. Uh, what type of surface is it? Is it wood? Is it concrete? Is it metal? Um, you know, you're going to have some kind of a blend of those those uh, materials. Uh, windows. What type of window it is? Is it wood? Is it vinyl? Is it aluminum? You know, you're going to know uh, what that is, and then each one of those has costs uh, associated with whether or not you're going to repair or you're going to replace those. Uh, I don't know. How, pretty much every property you walk onto this day and time, if it's a foreclosure or it's you know it's a dilapidated property, you're going to have windows that are going to have to be either replaced or at least panes uh, replaced. So just make sure you know those things. Landscaping, uh, really the things that you want to focus in on landscaping, you want to make sure you look at the trees and the shrubs. Are there any trees that are overhanging the roof? Uh, are there anything that would potentially cause damage to the roof? When you go to sell that property, that's something that the home inspector is going to write up. You know, say there's limbs touching the roof. You got to know that you got to make sure and take that stuff off. Um, if there's leaves accumulating on the top of the roof, you know that that's going to be written up by a home inspector as that's deteriorating on the roof. Leaf buildup on a roof will mold a roof, will cause deterioration in the machines. So just make sure that you uh, look into those things. Uh, hardscapes. Do I need to replace a sidewalk? Do I need to add a sidewalk? Do I need to replace a driveway? Those types of things are uh, things that you want to know when you are uh, when you're reviewing a property. <laughs> And then here's the trick is that it depends on what type of situation you're looking at. Is this a buy and hold rental? Well, you might put more weight on certain things than you do on a owner occupant retail fix and flip. It's just what's the property going to be used for when it's all said and done? And then what are the things that I need to know I need to focus on? Because uh, you're going to tweak not only the materials that you use, but also some things you may fix or may not fix depending on what you're going how you're going to exit that deal, <clears throat> or if it's going to be an in-house portfolio property. Uh, walls and ceilings, uh, you know, is it drywall throughout? Does it have paneling? Am I going to have to replace paneling? Um, I, I hate paneling. Oh, it's like the worst thing ever. Um, but sometimes you just can't get rid of it. Sometimes it's so evasive in the house that you've got to do something with it. And it just doesn't make cost sense to be able to take it out and get rid of it. So you just got to make those determinations while you're in there. Uh, wall conditions, you know, is it just simply I got a patch of paint, or do I need to actually tear some drywall out or patch some drywall that's already been kicked out because the vandals have gotten in there and you know had their party or whatever they do. Uh, quick little story, we got I got a phone call from the uh, Center Point Police not long ago. They were uh, we had a house that we had just bought. I think we had it like a week, but we hadn't had crews started on or whatever, <laughs> and so. Um, the back door wasn't exactly as secure as it should have been. Somebody had already been in once before, so we, we did it up the best we could, and then we moved on down, down the road to a couple of projects. Got a phone call from the police saying that, uh, you know, I think it was like 9 o'clock on a Saturday night, and uh, they said, they said, well, we've caught some people in your house. I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? What kind of, which one are we talking about? They're like, oh, this house over on such such street. And, uh, and I was like, oh, that house is big. It's fine. I was like, well, did they do any damage to it? It's like, no, they were just having like a raging party. You know, there were 18 high school kids in the house having a party on a Saturday night. Uh, and so then you start having that, you know, oh, God, am I covered for insurance? I mean, you start having all that. Blood. So note there, just make sure that when you buy a property, if they're going to start a run, just secure it. Put, you know, lock it. Make sure nobody can get in. Um, let's see. Ceiling types, smooth or textured. Who in here loves popcorn ceilings? <laughs> God, whoever like, whoever invented that machine should be shot. Um, but uh, yeah, 
Sometimes it's the only way to fix a roof though. I mean, it's either take down the entire ceiling or you just gotta go back and, and make it look not so ugly. So um, a lot of times on a rental, if it's a buy an old rental, you're gonna make that decision. And if, you know, if, it's, if you're gonna sell that owner occupant, everybody wants smooth ceilings, you're gonna scrape that ceiling and, and fix it. But, um, but you have to know, be able to know and identify what, what you're gonna do uh, to keep your numbers in line. Uh, let's see, doors and trim. How many doors do I have in the house? Do I need to replace entire door units? Can I get through with just replacing slabs? Uh, does it just need to fix the door hardware? Do, door hardware? Do I need to adjust, you know, fix the existing door? Is it a six panel door, hollow core? Is it a solid door? I mean, you know what I'm saying? You can get in, it's, there's just a ton of things that you need to have in your brain to be able to pull out and say, this is the route that I'm going and this is what I'm gonna do. Um, numbers of uh, doors to keep and replace, door styles, door hardware, and then uh, you wanna look at your trim. Do I need to replace the base molding? Do I need to replace the crown? Do I need to um, do window casings? Those types of things. You wanna get a measurement of all of those in linear feet so that you can run your calculations when you get back. Uh, painting, we talked about on the interior. Uh, paint the whole thing, patch it. Obviously, if it's a fix and flip, you're gonna paint the whole house, you're gonna redo everything uh, back to you. Uh, wall, ceilings, doors, trim, cabinets, closet shelves. Uh, I mean, you, you just have to look at all of those things. And then what you wanna do is get a total square footage for each room so that you can go back uh, when you're doing your numbers and, and make sure that you've got everything squared up for you. So, uh, flooring, what types of floor types in the room? Hardwood, laminate, tile, um, not only what it currently has, but what you, what you anticipate replacing that with if you have to replace it or fixing it. Um, and you want to obviously know the square footage of all of those surfaces as well. Um, here's a fun one, cabinets and countertops. Uh, you know, there's 10, there's 10 different ways that you can look at that. It's whether or not I'm gonna basically just rip the whole thing out and replace it. Am I gonna fix what's in there now? Uh, usually you just have to kind of gauge that and determine these are salvageable, uh, I've got a good cabinet guy, or I don't have a good cabinet guy, it'll cost me more in labor and time to you know, fix what's here, or is it just easier to rip it out and you know, put new stuff in. Uh, repair and replace countertops, uh, I'd say 99% of the time you're ripping the countertops out, you're replacing those countertops. Is it gonna be uh, a wood surface? Is it gonna be granite? Uh, is it gonna be a laminate surface? Those are the things that you wanna know. Um, you want to know how many linear feet of cabinets. The easiest way, and I'll show you when we get into the calculations, uh, it's really easier. You don't need to go in there and go, all right, I need an 18 inch cabinet, I need a 24 inch cabinet. You, you don't need to go, in your first walkthrough, you don't need to know all that. Just take some quick and dirty measurements. Just pull your measuring tape out, how many linear feet of cabinets do I have? And then there's some, some numbers that you can apply to that to give you a pretty close number of what you're gonna, what you're gonna come up with uh, cost-wise. Um, Square feet of backsplash and the type of backsplash that you're going to use. Um, electrical, this is one that trips up a lot of people. <sighs> Pretty much every municipality in Birmingham, the greater Birmingham area now, has adopted the 2017 code. If you change a light fixture and the inspector walks into your house, you're done. He's going to basically make you upgrade the entire house and bring it up to 2017 code. Um, I'm, trust me, I fought this, I fought the good fight for all of you. <laughs> all right, I've, I've been back and forth with every inspector in the, in the area and they aren't budging. Uh, in fact, this is one of the areas where they love to catch people, is on the, uh, on the electrical. And I understand it, electrical is, a, is, a, is an issue. I mean, I'm, we've had houses burned down because of electrical issues. So uh, the last thing you want on your conscience is that somebody you know, had got hurt or died in your house because you didn't change out the appropriate picture. Um, so always change the plugs and switches and the face plates. It does two things. One, it gives you the opportunity to make sure your system is tight and it also gives you the opportunity to, uh, uh, it just looks good. I mean, it's a, it's a cosmetic, easy see when people walk in, they go, you, you could do nothing else but change the plugs and the switches in a wall and they walk in and go, oh man, you upgraded the whole system. You're like, not really. But 
It's, it's that whole thing. I'm not saying deceive anybody, but it's just that impression of people see when they walk into your house. And what's what gets your house's soul? It's the impression that people see when they walk into your house. Uh, first impressions. Uh, you want to count all the number of the light fixtures by types, um, flush mount, ceiling fans, uh, recessed, sconces, you know, all of that. You want to make sure you're doing it. Uh, electrical panel location, is it in a closet? Uh, if the house was built in 1950 to 1965, odds are some closet has a panel uh, in it and it's got to come out. So you got to know that going in that that, that panel is going to have to be removed from the house, either put on an outside or just removed outside of a closet. They won't, uh, they won't let you do it. Uh, we've got a house that we're doing right now. I thought I was being pretty good. I thought I was like, I got this inspector. I know, I know what he's doing. So we had an area where it was kind of ugly. It was a basement wall. They had a, um, uh, a panel system that was just massive. It took like the whole wall and they had wire. It was like a rat's nest, man. It was just like wires coming in all over the place. And I was, but I couldn't, it was already updated. So I wasn't gonna revamp the whole system and spend a couple of thousand dollars doing that. It just wasn't necessary, but it was just ugly. It was an eyesore and we were finishing out the basement, putting a bedroom, putting a bathroom down there. So I was like, I gotta hide this thing somehow. So I built like this, uh, I built a frame wall across for it. I made it too short to be considered what I thought a closet so that, uh, that when the inspector came in, I was like, I got this. So he's gonna, he's gonna be like, oh, that's a closet. I'm like, no, man, you can't put anything in that. It's not a closet. So got it all framed up. He came in. I even set the, the panel was actually in the middle of the wall uh, from what we were framing in. So I left just a cased opening right there so that he couldn't say I had a door on it so that it wouldn't kind of, see, I'm, I'm thinking all this stuff through. I'm thinking I got this guy. He comes in, he's like, oh, it's all gotta go. You can't have that, that's gonna be a closet. They're gonna, they're gonna stack all this stuff. So I asked him, I said, I said, well, what would you rather have? Would you rather have a wall here hiding this albatross of an electrical system that's unsightly or or would you have some, would you rather have something that's out, nice, pretty, and the kids aren't gonna be able to walk right up and just grab it and you know touch it or doing something like that? He said, I don't care about all that. He says, well, the code book says you can't have it in a closet, get it out of the closet. So of course we had to rip all that down and do it. So I say that just to tell you that they're gonna follow code period. It doesn't matter what it is, so you just know your codes when it comes to electrical, uh, what you can and cannot do. Um, if you're a buy and hold guy or a turnkey rental guy, this, this is one that you hate. The rule is that if you upgrade the system now, everything has to go to what they call an arc fault breaker versus and a ground fault breaker. They've always had ground faults, like in the wet areas, kitchens, bathrooms. But the arc faults uh, came around, I think in 2009, they started pushing it, uh, but they actually brought it in full speed in 2015. And basically what that means is if you look at their panel, almost every breaker in your panel has to be an arc fault breaker now. And all the plugs have to be tamper resistant plugs. That's part of the new code. What that means to you as an investor is two things. One, your electrical repair bill just went up $3,000. And your, you're gonna be getting phone calls, if it's a rental, you're gonna be getting phone calls every week because they plug in a heater or they plug in a, a dryer or something and it trips, break immediately. They're, they are super, super sensitive, but you gotta put them in. So, we're, well, we're recording, so I won't say this too loud, but um, <laughs> have your electrician go in there, get everything past code, pull that, go back in and put in the regular. <laughs> so, there's my tip, if I go to jail tomorrow, not me. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway. You're gonna find that on rentals. The, the fix and flip stuff is not gonna make that big a deal. They're, I mean, they just have to have them in there, it's not a big deal. But the renter stuff, you know, they don't run their heat during the winter, they put in space heaters, and anytime they're just, it's gonna trip them immediately. Um, Jonathan, we just had to do one on his houses uh, over there, literally like less than 24 hours, the tenant was calling, I'm breaking, I'm tripping breakers all over. Went over there, she had like five space heaters plugged in. And then you're like, well, there you go. So uh, wiring, two-prong non-grounded or three-prong. Uh, make sure 
that you know which is which and you know how to fix which it is. Um, three prong obviously is a ground, it's got two wires and one grounded wire and uh, two prong is a non-grounded system. Uh, you know, they didn't have grounded systems until I think in the late 70s, I think is when they came out with that. But um, the, the one good thing that an arc fault system will do is an arc fault system will ground a non-grounded two prong system. So uh, I know that's probably just way more technical than y'all wanted to get into. But, uh, but just know that, just know that the one, I guess if there's one good thing about that is that it will ground a house system uh, that's on two prong. <clears throat> okay, plumbing. Uh, when you get in, what am I gonna do to this bathroom? Am I gonna change out the vanity sinks? Am I gonna change out the toilets, showers, supplies and drain lands? A lot of people will come in, they'll do their, their initial assessment and they'll say, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna change that toilet, I'm gonna change that vanity, but they never look at what's below. They never look at the supply lines or the drain lines. So always just open up a cabinet, look underneath there, take a picture of it, that way whoever you're trying to sell the house to can identify what's, you know, what they're dealing with. Because if it's got cast iron pipe in there, odds are it's gonna need to get pulled out um, and it's gonna need to be changed over to PVC. Uh, if it's got, you know, galvanized line for the water supplies, then you're gonna to wanna to change those out and you're gonna put PEX in, all things that are maintenance-free items, things that are updated that, uh, that you're not gonna have problems with going down, on down the road. Because there's nothing worse than getting through a whole renovation, doing all this grand work and the place looks beautiful and you move the tenant in or you move the homeowner in and three days later they call you and go, man, my stuff is just flowing. I got stuff coming all over the place. It's because you didn't go a little bit deeper and just address those things like the drain lines um, swapping them out. Plumbing is really not that expensive. In the grand scheme of your budget, the plumbing piece is really not that expensive, especially PEX is cheap. Um, it's a whole lot easier to do it on the front end than it is to come back in and do it on the back end, especially if you spend all that time making it all pretty and then your toilet overflows and it messes up what you just did. Um, interior foundation walls, look, let's say you're in a basement, you know, look for cracks, fissures in the wall, uh, look for if it's what they call a stair step crack. Uh, those are the ones you don't really want to see because that means there's actually been movement in lateral toward the foundation. Make sure that that's, uh, you know, that's not the case. It can be fixed, but to the degree that it is, uh, depends on how much it's going to be. Um, if, you, if you notice when you're walking through a property that there are foundation issues or things that you see that might be foundation issues, at that point, I would just always bring in a foundation specialist um, I would bring in a structural engineer. Um, structural engineers are, you know, it's $250 to $400 depending on you. I think the guy we use is like $250. Bucks. He'll come in and give you a simple report and tell you it's good, you just need to do this or that, or it's really bad and you need to just walk away. Um, let's see. I don't know how that got in there, but. What happens when you do a presentation at two o'clock in the morning? Um, HVAC, what type of HVAC are you dealing with? Is it a package unit? Is it a split unit? Is it gas? Is it electric? Um, what size is it? You know, you look on there, make sure you know how to read the sticker on the side of the AC unit to make sure you can determine what tonnage unit it is. Um, the easiest way just to kind of figure out is just do, you know, a ton per 500 square feet. Uh, that's usually kind of about the norm. Some people will stretch it up to 600 square feet. Uh, we like to do about 500 square feet per ton. Um, you gotta look at the air handler. How old is the air handler? How old is the uh, heat pump? You know, those types of things you need to look at. Is, is the unit on? Test it, turn it on, walk outside, stand by the unit. Does the thing rattle like it's about to get up and like walk out the backyard? I mean, you, you, you need to know those things when you're, when you're looking at it. Uh, because the guy that's going to buy that property from you is going to want to know am I faced with a five, six thousand dollar AC bill that's going to blow my budget. Uh, duct work. This is one of those that people just don't ever think about. They don't even look at the duct work when they go in. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've crawled under a house and looked at the duct work and it looks like Swiss cheese. I mean, it's like the rats have had a party and just torn the things apart. And the tenant or the owner is complaining, man, it just gets so hot in here. Because the crawl space is 10 degrees. You know, it's, it's, everything is, it 
it's really you got to look at those things. You got to make sure that you're kind of hitting those little fine tuned stuff. Um, air returns and event registers. Uh, pull a register up. Is the thing like full of whatever people put down in registers? I know kids throw stuff down in there just over time, 60 years worth of buildup in there. There's going to be stuff. Does that need to be cleaned out? Uh, and then you need to look at just final cleaning, trash out, debris removal. You know, is there junk all over the yard? Do I need to make sure that they understand that they're going to have to get you know a clean out crew to come in here and uh, and do stuff? How many dumpsters is it going to take for, uh, for us to do? Um, additions, general framing, repairs, and additions. Now you can walk through a house. We get a lot of phone calls with people that say, "Hey, I've got this two bedroom, one bath house. It's going to be a great little house. You can do." You know, two bedroom is just not optimal. There are people who obviously can rent out, but you're not going to get your maximized rent. You need to have at least three bedrooms. So we always ask, was well, there room to add a third bedroom? Or is it feasible to do so? Know that when they tell you, say, man, you know, it's, it's got a room off of this area that can be converted, be a nice little bedroom, uh, or it's got area off of the back that can be converted or an addition can be put into that. Um, you need to know how much framing is going to be needed. This stuff gets a little deeper into like, hey, I'm going to bring my contractor out. You know, I need to know they're going to pay this. But if you have some general knowledge about this, you know that you can take some, make some pretty good estimates, es estimations. <coughs> um, when you're up in the attic, look at the rafters. You know, it, does it look like a ski slope or is it straight? Does it look pretty solid? You want to know those things. Uh, is it two by eight? Is it two by ten? Uh, floor joists. You know, when you're, you can tell when you're walking across the floor, you can tell if it's got floor damage. I mean, if you're bouncing like a trampoline, you know, something's, something's not good there. Um, wall stud, repair, replacement. A lot of times you'll walk into a house and see there's drywall missing. You know, you take a look at the studs, or you'll see a spot on the wall. We had a perfect example. Um, week before last, we bought a house, walked into the house, and there was this one little spot down in the corner. And it was just a piece of uh, base molding, and it had some dark like molds. It's you know just some wheel pump. Don't ever say mold. It's uh it's just a dark stuff. We don't know what it is. So <laughs> we don't know what that is. <clears throat> yeah, it's just dirt. Somebody keep dirt on the wall. Gonna, yeah. So just take. Uh, I'm looking at this this spot, and I was like, man. And there happened to be a window right here, and so. I don't know what this is going to be like, but I know there's I know there's something going on behind the wall right here. So I started to, uh, pulling back the sheetrock and the wall, and yep, right there, it's water damage, studs are completely rotted out. I mean, I can't believe this side of the house is not like falling down. By the time I finished, 30 feet later, down the wall, the entire side of the house was completely rotted out. So guess what I got to do last Sunday? We got to rip out an entire wall and rebuild that. Well, it's a thousand dollars that we didn't plan to spend when we saw, oh, well, it's just an initial walkthrough. We missed it. And yes, we miss things. You're always going to miss some things. You know, you can't be perfect. But what you try to do is you try to get enough of this in your memory bank that you can try to start, you know, spotting some of those things. But that's a prime example of where just missing one little thing costs thousands of dollars and was much more involved than what we, we planned to do in that rehab. And it triggered an inspection by that city. Yeah. Um, room additions. Uh, you know, is there going to be a room added? Bathrooms, bedrooms. We'll go over some numbers that we'll talk about, kind of some general numbers of how to estimate how much an, an addition is going to cost by square footage, whether it's a bedroom or a bathroom, uh, to give you some rough numbers that you can play in. Um, just threw in some, some some light numbers there with roof and footings additions, square foot approximately $95 a square foot. Um, and if it's under the existing roof, then $80 a square foot, uh, just in general numbers to be able to uh, to look at. Uh, how, Brian, how am I doing on time? Great. Uh, you're good. Perfect. You doing good, guys? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Any help at all? <laughs> um, Insulation. This is another one people miss. Um, does it need insulation? You go into these old houses, they've got maybe you know this much, if any, insulation up in the attic. Uh, it's usually toxic 
you don't want to be up there very long. Um, so just know that you're going to have to put in new insulation in the house uh, or not. You're going to get phone calls saying my heating bill or my air conditioning bill is through the roof. You know, it's not that expensive, but just make sure you, you, you address it. Uh, most of the smaller, most of the older houses are not going to have insulation in the walls. Uh, the only reason you're going to put insulation in those walls is obviously if you're stripping it down to the studs and you're, and you're going to replace that, um, that wall system. Uh, nine times out of ten, you're not going to have that. It's actually not a bad thing. People will argue back and forth on this, but the, the way they used to build old houses is they had actually a vapor in between the walls. And I argue, I'm on the pro side of that, that that actually is insulation in itself. And so I don't think there's any need to go in and poke holes in the walls and spray foam insulation, place insulation and all that. But it's vapor barrier. Like it's like a, uh, it's like an air cavity in between the outside wall and the, and the drywall or whatever surface they have on the inside. It's just a vapor area in there. And basically what that does is it actually holds heat or cool in between the wall. 90% of the heat and cool loss in a house goes through the roof. So as long as you have good in attic insulation in a house, your walls really aren't, you're not losing that much. If you've got good double pane insulated windows in a house, you're gonna, you're gonna see a noticeable difference in the, in the bills, whether you do the walls or not. So, uh, good question. Uh, let's see. Demo and trash out, we already went through all that. All right, ready to get into the fun stuff? Want to talk some numbers? <laughs> if I start to see some snoozing in there, I'll know where. This stuff can be dry, guys. I know it can be, but you know, unless you're a rehab junkie like me, um, this kind of stuff is what I love to, to do. And, uh, and when you get into it, uh, the more you kind of learn, the more it gets exciting. So. Um, I don't, although I don't like the number crunching piece of it, I like being out on the job sites. Um, all right, so here's a couple of things. What are you using to create your renovation scope to work for? Show of hands, who uses spreadsheets? Okay. Who's, uh, who's using some type of system, some type of store-bought system that's off the shelf? Okay. 99% um, of people start out spreadsheet. I mean, it's just an easy way to get started. You don't really know what you're doing in the first place anyway, so you kind of kind of build things that work in your mind to help you come up with it. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I know guys that do 100 houses a month and they work off a spreadsheet. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think it's crazy. I'm going nuts trying to do that many spreadsheets. But, um, but it's just all in what you get comfortable with. But there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. You can prepare yourself prepared. You know, it just takes time to build the template out. Just remember when you're building your template out that you got to be able to give that template to somebody like a subcontractor or a contractor, and they got to be able to understand it. So just make sure that it's, you know, easy to read. Um, it's not very professional. You know, people look at it and they kind of. If you're trying to give that impression that you're a hit, you're a heavy hitter in the market. The last thing you want to be doing is giving like a little spreadsheet, you know, that's got, you know, take two lights out. I mean, just make it a little bit more, uh, more presentable when you're doing that. I promise you, if you come out and do, I used to have this guy that would, he put like this book together. He would come to, I don't know how many hours he would spend doing this stuff, and he would call me like, hey, I got this house. What did you go look at? And I was like, I don't have time to go through this book, dude. This is like. 90 pages of stuff. I'm not going to go read through them. Number one, I can't decide what you're writing. So just put something simple together, pictures, clear, concise number of here's what I, here's what I want to get done, and they'll, they'll take it from there. Um, we actually have made the transition into doing, uh, we've, we've researched several systems over the last year, finally settled on one that we're going to uh, run into. I'll share that with you. A little bit, but um, it's it's all about getting things in a systemized order. There's a whole lot of difference between doing one property a month and doing 20 properties a month. And I can tell you that when you're doing one to two properties a month, okay, you can kind of get through and, and do things a little more manual. 
But when you start jumping up and you try to take your game to the next level and you're operating on the scale that some of the heavy folks are in town and around the country, you've got to have some type of system in place that is repeatable and that other people can access and use and you can disseminate information for it. If you don't, you're just gonna spin your wheels and it's just not gonna move like you want to. Um, right now, uh, this particular month, we've got 30 houses under rehab and there's no way possibly that I can be on every single job site every single day for 30 jobs. It just is, there's not enough for me to go around. Um, and so if you don't have a system in place to monitor all of that and have your project manager people inputting data into those systems, then it's gonna get lost, things aren't gonna get done right, your time frames are gonna be expanded, it's all gotta be in a system. So what's the key word? <laughs> okay, uh, all right. Disclaimer, like I said, these are not exact 100% numbers that you can rely on 100% of the time. They are generalization numbers of over the years of contracting that I've put together that actually build out something that you can come into with a reasonably amount of space and say, I've got a good number that I can work with and I can estimate from within a variance here. So some of these numbers are dead spot on, but they're really just more of, and a lot of it has to do with what type of materials they're gonna use, they're gonna affect this, uh, that will affect these numbers, and, um, and who's doing it, that kinds of things. So they're just a generalization to kind of give you, get you in the mindset of how to cat factor these numbers. Uh, roofing, number of shingles bundles. Uh, take the total square foot of the house times $2.50, and that should usually give you a pretty close number of, uh, of what your roofing cost is going to run. Um, we try to do as much as we possibly can on a square foot basis when calculating our numbers, <laughs> just try to simplify on the front end. It just helps things look out. Um, somebody was telling me the other day they sent their son, they send their son in. That's how they know whether they've got a good estimator sheet. They send their son in that doesn't know anything about building and they see if he can come out. Um, I'm not saying go that far, but I'm not I'm definitely not saying one of my girls in to do that. Um, eaves and cornice, $6.50 a linear foot. Um, so just calculate how much eaves you've got, <clears throat> how much, uh, how many linear feet of that are, and then times it by $6.50, and that'll give you a good rough. Now these are all material and labor inclusive. So this should give you your total cost of you know, your materials and your labor costs in. Uh, exterior walls and sheathing, uh, five to seven dollars a square foot based on what type of material you're using. Um, if you're just using regular lap siding, things of that nature, you can go in the lower end on the five dollars to seven uh, would be more of the higher. If you're using shingle, uh, cedar shingle, something like that, it might be a little bit higher. Uh, gutters and downspouts, a good number to work with is three dollars and fifty cents a square foot. Um, when you are measuring gutters, it's not just the gutter run, but you also got to measure your feet for your downspouts too. So make sure that you include that in your in your uh, in your tally. Uh, foundations. If I've got to do a poured foundation, um, if I've got to do a room addition, I know I got to pour a footing and some foundation. Then around roughly about twenty-two dollars a square foot gets you your material and your labor uh, cost built in there. Uh, painting. We put just a flat $2. Uh, sometimes we pay a dollar a square foot. Sometimes we pay $2.50 a square foot. But a good number when you're just doing your initial walkthrough, put $2 a square foot on there and that will, uh, that will make you, you know, pretty close in. Um, a lot of that has to do too with the level of painting that you're gonna do. This is for exterior painting uh, on this, this particular quote. Uh, decks, porches, patios. <clears throat> Estimate somewhere around eighteen dollars a square foot. That's going to uh, give you a pretty close ballpark on what you're uh, what you're looking at for the cost of that. Uh, landscaping. We break it down into light, mid range, or heavy. Obviously, it's going to depend on how how extensive you want to get with it. But we estimate somewhere around seven fifty in our budget for light re rehab or light landscaping. That's typically going to be like. We're gonna change some shrubs, do a planter bed in the front, um, cut the grass, those types of things. 
Uh, that's all built into the 750. Mid-range, you know, we might do a little bit more extensive planning. Uh, we might do some more uh, landscaping as far as building berms or something of that nature. Um, and then of course heavy, we're putting down sod, we're planting some trees, we're doing shrubbery bushes, we're taking all kinds of stuff. Basically a clean slate. We're gonna wipe out everything and just start all over. That does not include tree removal. Uh, tree removal is different. We do uh, 70, 750 on a small, 1500 on a medium, and 3500 on, uh, on a large tree. Uh, or you can do it the math way, and you can do between $65 and $70 per inch width of the tree. So take the ruler out, go around there. So, uh, if you want to, but it will, it's pretty close. It actually works pretty good. I've tested it a couple of times. It comes out pretty close to what the, what the tree guys are going to charge you to take out a tree. <clears throat> Uh, hardscapes, you know, if you're doing driveways, walkways, sidewalks, $3.50 a square foot will get you in the ballpark. Uh, retaining walls, around $30 a square foot gets you, uh, gets you in there. Uh, usually you can just kind of estimate that type of stuff, how tall it's going to be, how, well, how long it's going to be, and, um, you know, your standard material. This is like geostone stack stuff, paver stones, concrete stack stones. Uh, walls and ceilings, uh, $1.25 a square foot for drywall, that's install and finish, and um, that's not going to be like painting. That's just putting it up, mud or taking it mudded. Uh, doors and windows, replace exterior doors, you want to average somewhere around $250 a door for an entire steel uh, or a metal door unit. Uh, replacing interior doors will be around $175 a door. Uh, that's going to be just a standard six panel hollow core interior door unit that you would pick up from Home Depot. <clears throat> that's going to include your materials and your labor in that. Uh, replacing windows, you can get them more or less, just depends, but about the average is going to be about $350 bucks per window when you uh, factor in materials and labor. Um, and that's for a good um, uh, double pane. Uh, double double hung uh, window. Painting uh, for basic painting, which is something like maybe you would just do in your rental property. You're going to go in, you're going to patch paint, uh, patch primer paint. Uh, looking at around a dollar fifty a square foot is a good number to run with. <clears throat> I think the other day we actually got somebody to do it for a dollar square foot. So, um, but that's not the norm. It's usually going to be somewhere in dollar fifty square foot. Uh, on your advanced, you're going to be somewhere closer to two dollars square foot. Uh, it's going to be for your higher end fix and flip stuff. Um, and I'll say, additionally with these numbers, just know that it's it's what you negotiate. It's what you negotiate with your people. You know, it's there are guys that are going to come in. They're going to give you. Oh, I'm going to charge six dollars square foot for painting. That's not your guy. That ain't the guy you want. Painting. I don't care how it looks when it gets done. It, that's just not the guy. Because I know I've seen a dollar a square foot paint job, and I've seen a six dollar a square foot paint job, and I can't really tell the big difference between them. So um, there are certain things I just don't, I refuse to pay, uh, you know, higher rates for. Uh, flooring is a basic, mid range, high end, depends on what your, what your type of project you're doing. Uh, can be 250 a square foot up to six dollars a square foot uh, high end for your uh, for your flooring. Uh, ref about a norm is 250 to 350 a square foot on the existing refinishing hardwoods. Um, I've pushed it down on some of my guys down to roughly a buck fifty to a buck seventy five, but that's because they do volume. I mean, your average guy that's coming in, it's new. They're going to they're going to charge you around a minimum 250 a square foot. Once you get a relationship with them. They use them on a consistent basis, so you can start to kind of drive that down a little bit. Uh, installing new hardwoods and finish, you're going to be somewhere between five and six dollars a square foot, just for a standard um, two and a quarter inch oak, um, either number one or number two. Okay, uh, cabinets, countertops, and backsplashes. When running your numbers on those, you're going to be somewhere around seventy dollars uh, linear foot for just your basic. And when I say basic, that's, uh, you know, I know nobody ever shops at Southeastern Salvage in here. So um, <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to be your, 
pre-assembled, uh, either Home Depot painted um, or your Southeastern Salvage unpainted wood cabinet they put together. Uh, Semi-custom, obviously, is going to be three-quarter side hardwood and then um, and the rest press. And then your custom, you're getting your designer to come in and actually um, put you some nice cabinets in. Um, we've done half a million dollar houses and I've put semi-custom cabinets in there and they, they love them, they rave them. It's, you don't, my point there is you don't have to break the bank on cabinets to get a nice looking cabinet. Everybody right now is gravitating towards white shaker cabinets. Uh, they all like the open, clean, white feel of cabinets. And so, you know, why would you go spend $225 on your foot when you get the same look and same wow factor from $125? Uh, countertops, laminate, wood, and when I say wood, uh, we use a lot of, I'm a big fan of butcher block uh, for our rental properties, and the reason I like those is laminate, what happens? They take a hot pot, put it down there, they do something, it burns a hole, you got to rip the whole cabinet out and replace it, and it's, it's a waste. You put down a wood cabinet, some form, of, it doesn't have to be butcher block, but you put down a wood surface, you seal it, you stain it, you seal it, you put it down, if they scorch it or they mess it up, then all you do is you come in, you sand it down, you restain the area, and you spot fix that area. Much easier for when you're doing your turnovers, keeps your overall cost down. <clears throat> um, granite, I mean, you just, I'm not putting granite in a rental in the end. Um, but in, in, the, uh, in the fix and flip and the higher end stuff, it's standard. You're gonna put granite in there. Uh, you don't have to go spend <clears throat> you know, a ton of money on granite either. There's some good suppliers here in town that uh, that you can get what they call their either remnant pieces or you can get some of their stuff that maybe have been on their shelf a little bit longer. Uh, you can get them down. I've gotten it down to somewhere in the seven dollar a square foot range for uh, for a nice granite. So um, if I had a warehouse, you know, if everybody had a warehouse, you could go stock and install that stuff, but it just doesn't make sense to do that, at least on these one-offs. Uh, tile backsplash, basically $3 a square foot is, um, is a good number to work with. Your electrical, like I said, you're always gonna change your plugs, your switches, your face plates. Uh, $10 per outlet is a good number just to, uh, to run, to pay someone that's a handyman uh, that has electrical skills can come in and change out plugs. Uh, replace existing light fixtures, is $35 per fixture on the basic. Um, that's materials and labor, and then upwards of uh, $75 uh, for fixtures. I, I didn't put anything in there for high uh, because that's gonna be subjective. It's gonna be, that's gonna be your higher end fix and flip. You're just gonna have to buy custom items. Uh, not custom, but you're gonna buy a, a higher dollar fixture for that. Um, don't ever let the home buyer pick out their own fixtures. Um, <laughs> because that will come back to bite you every time. Um, we had a situation where we did that, which, which we actually, you know, you learn stuff in this business all the time. And we had someone who came in and wanted to buy our house. It was about 80% complete. And they wanted to go ahead and buy it. We're like, great, we're gonna get under contract before we finish this thing. It's gonna be awesome. You know what, we're, gonna be, we're so happy that you did that. We're gonna be not gonna let you pick out your fixtures. And so they picked out their fixtures and then they didn't buy the house. They backed out two days before closing. And so we're stuck with a $500 chandelier that I originally would have put $125 chandelier in. So, you know, just, just be cautious of those types of things. Um, install new fixtures and wiring, basic $150 per fixture, um, up to somewhere around $400 per fixture, depending on what you're putting in. Um, electrical upgrade to pass. 2017 code, uh, a good number to run with is just if I'm gonna do a full. <laughs> I'm sorry, when you talking about electrical upgrade, it says square feet, is that the whole, like the whole house? Yeah, yeah. Just take the square footage of the house times $3, and that'll get you pretty close in on, on what it's gonna cost you. Um, you know, this, this, that all goes into negotiation too, when you're, when you're dealing with folks, because uh, I've had, Five people come out and all five people will give you a totally different number 
um, anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000. It just depends on uh, you know how, how much they want your business. Uh, electrical, if you're gonna do a full rewire, I'd step it up to $5 a square foot. Plumbing, you wanna do basic $175 a fixture. That's gonna get you your fixture, your supply lines, your set out, all that's gonna be encompassed in that. Uh, if you're putting in a higher end fixture, the variation there is gonna be what the cost of your additional fixtures is gonna be. Uh, full plumbing on a rental, we average somewhere around $3,000 for a full replumb. That's a standard three bedroom, two bath house, including one kitchen. Um, retail, you're gonna be looking at somewhere around 5,000 to do a full uh, system on your uh, replumb. Okay, uh, interior foundation walls and slabs. I just put a note in here that, you know, really the, there's no way to put a, a, a number around this. If you get into a house and you find that it's got structural problems, uh, you can generalize some numbers of what you think it's gonna be, but my suggestion would just be get a foundation repair specialist in there, have him do a quote on it, and you'll know for sure. Um, there's been several times where the key is knowing on the front end. You know, you, you don't know what you don't know. So when you're in a house and you get somebody in there that's a specialist can tell you on a piece of paper, this house needs two helical piers, this, this house needs to have some joint plank house and needs still reinforced posts every six, seven feet, you know that. And so then you're gonna know that, hey, I could have got this house at this price, but now I gotta go get it at another price lower because I gotta make up for that extra $10,000 and I'm gonna have to spend to fix the foundation. And it'll save you a lot of heartache down the road, for sure. Because um, we can't all be like the guys that, who that right? Brian did that video where, like, you just raise the price of the house. You know, that, that's all you gotta do. It doesn't work that way. Um, split unit on the HVAC around $1,200 a ton average. Uh, package unit around $1,500 per ton. Uh, duct work and air replacement, you can kind of, just 1,500 bucks should get a normal three bedroom, two bath house on running your duct. Sorry about my question, sorry. Not at all. So sorry, as you can see. What is a package? Okay, good question. Package unit is, there's, there's two types of units that you can get from, well there's three, I won't go into the third, but the, the, the main two types of uh, HAC units you see are either a package unit, which is a completely enclosed unit that sits on the outside of the house. There's no unit on the inside. Your air handler and all of that is, uh, and your heat pump are all condensed in one box, per se, on the outside, and you've got your duct running into the side of the house. That's, that's a package unit. The split unit is the one where you've got your condensing unit or your heat pump on the outside that runs, circulates the air, and then on the inside of the house, you've got your air handler, which then attaches to your ductwork. So you've got two separate units on the inside. Okay, uh, framing, general framing repairs and additions. Uh, if I got to replace roof rafters or replace them, I'm averaging about $35 a linear foot for those rafters. Uh, that's a standard two by eight, two by 10 uh, rafter. And floor joist repairs, around $25 uh, a linear foot. So if you're in the kitchen and you start to see it's, you know, shaking, moving, the cabinets are falling through the floor, uh, you know that uh, you know that you got to do some floor joist repair down there. Um, we just did a house in Avondale where we were doing the uh, uh, we were doing our demo, and it was a pretty extensive rehab. So we, we had pretty much we were taking everything down to the studs. We went into a back area that was an addition, and we started pulling up the floor, and we found that there was uh, there was a three quarter inch layer of decking another three quarter inch layer of um, OSB hardwood three quarter underneath that and another air of Luon and uh, vinyl underneath that. And so it was literally like this, I mean, it was like this thing we put in there. Well, all of that made the floor seem like it was pretty solid when we went through. Well, when you started pulling out of that, the entire floor system of the whole back, which consisted of a bedroom, a bathroom, and a, and a mudroom, was completely rotted out, was completely gone. So we had to rip all of that out. Well, five grand later, you know, 
wasn't it? We were thinking, okay, flooring, fifteen hundred bucks. It turned out to be a five grand fix. So just those are things you want to take into consideration. That's how. That's why you get dirty. That's why you go underneath the house. That's why you look at the floor joists. You look and make sure there's no termite or rot in those floors. It's always going to be in the floors, in the kitchen, and in the uh, in the bathrooms. I can pretty much guarantee you're going to have some type of rot in there. Uh, room additions uh, with the roof foundation addition, ninety-five dollars a square foot. Uh, if it's an existing room that you're going to convert, you can run it about eighty dollars a square foot. Uh, and what? That's that's everything. That's like getting your your plugs, your your lights, your framing, your ceiling, your drywall. I mean, that's that's an all-encompassing number. So that should be start to finish your your cost per square foot. Uh, insulation, take the total square foot of the house, multiply it by 0.85 uh, or 85 cents a square foot. Um, that's a good, that'll get you where you typically want to be. Uh, initial demo, trash out, final cleaning. If it's light, we budget 750. If it's a medium, 1200. And then if it's a heavy, clean out. Um, if they have to put the hazmat suits on to go in, then and that's usually going to be your heavier uh, one. Dumpsters, Average cost is going to be around $400 a dumpster. Uh, that's for a 30 yard uh, dumpster. Most people just, they don't care that whether it's 20 or 30 yard, they just say what you want, take it through. Um, but that's going to be your average around town. Uh, I've gotten it down to low as 350, uh, but on a consistent basis, just running it over to 400. Final cleaning and get ready fees. We always send in a cleaning crew. We always pay 250 bucks to our cleaning crews to go in and make sure everything's uh, spot, spot clean. Uh, on your fix and flips, if you're going to be staging, which I highly recommend doing staging, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. Money well spent on your fix and flips. Uh, 2000 for your low end, that's going to get you a couple of rooms, you know, your main rooms, your kitchens, uh, I mean, your kitchen, your bathrooms, your master bedroom, and master bath, that's usually going to get you there. Um, medium, if it's a little higher price, you're going to put a little higher into it. And then your high end staging uh, shouldn't cost you any more than five. 5K. Who in here stages or flips? Two people. Don't, don't stage. We'll sell them all. No, just kidding. Stage your houses. It really makes a difference. Um, not only for the MLS, from your pictures, all of that. It just kind of helps. People, unfortunately, just don't have vision when they walk into a blank slate. They can't see what the house, they can't see themselves living in the house. When you have furniture in there, they can look at it and go, oh man, my dresser would look great here. And they, it just opens up their, their thought processes. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> Head ready to explode. <laughs> uh, as I said before, we'll have, uh, if you want a copy of this, you know, we'll make it available to you. Uh, just get us your email address and we'll, uh, we'll email it out to you for your copy. Um, if you need any help with locating, finding properties, anything of that nature you want to look at, you know, I need to run a couple of deals through uh, REI Trader. We're here to help you do any of that stuff. Um, you know, we want to add, try to add as much value as we can to the market. So just, um, we're here to help. Ask us any questions you need. You mentioned that uh, your projects are always going to we do a standard 10 percent across the board for all projects uh, for what we call latent defects um, and then if it's a higher end project if we're if we're up in that three to five hundred thousand dollar range we may even throw 20 percent in there um, you, you can't build that buffer high enough um, but you can build it, it's kind of like an oxymoron. You can, but you can't, because sometimes you may miss a deal because you've overestimated the latent defects. That's why it's so important to go through all of these things when you go through, because it, it helps reduce the, the, the fudge factor when you're out. One thing that you're talking about is uh, termite treatment or coverage. If you go to your property, the kind of termite thing is in there's an active contract. Mm -hmm. Uh, from a pest 
are you using bait stations, liquid applied for your coverage for something you would hold? Yeah, that, I'm glad you caught that. Um, <clears throat> if it already has a bond, then yeah, we'll look at the bond and see, you know, does it cover that? Um, what I've found is that most of them will have, they have some kind of loophole. It's retreat, yeah. yeah, it's just going to be a retreat. It's not really going to solve the problem. Uh, we have a company that we work here with locally that um, they come in and they do all of our stuff for. I think they charge us for just a basic. It's 250 to do to do a bond on it, and then if uh, if we take it the full amount, I can actually for like 450 they'll come in, they'll put ground skirt down. They'll treat all of the joys. They'll they'll encapsulate and uh, and guarantee that if they come back, they'll come back out free of charge. So um, that's one of those items you just kind of have to look at when you're looking at it, does it does it warrant that? But I, I think yeah, 250 bucks is well spent uh, on a property, especially the stuff that, that you know the house has been you know 50s, 60s, 70s. You're going to typically have uh, stuff on a crawl space. You're going to have some termite damage in there. It varies. Um, my rule is seven years or older. Seven years or older, I get rid of it and put a new one in. Because uh, between seven and ten years is, is when is kind of the normal lifespan of an AC unit and your buyers are going to ask you for it anyway. You can do this massive rehab and do all this stuff and make the house look pretty and leave like this 15 year old ACU out there and they're going to be like, damn, you know, it's just not going to look pretty. So you just go ahead and factor it in. But to answer your question, seven years, anything older than seven years, you just go ahead and factor that in. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. It depends on, I would say for for beginner, um, there's a system called Joist that's, uh, that's out there. <clears throat> uh, what I like about Joist from the beginning is it's very simple. It's got an app version that, um, now it does, just like any system, it requires some setup on the front end. You gotta go in, you gotta build out some tables, you gotta build out some templates, things of that nature. But once you get all that set up, Joist is very user friendly. You can pull it up on your phone while you're at a project. You can go room by room, depending on, we, I have mine set up by room. So we can, uh, you can just add up, go, I'm going to the bathroom, I need to do a sink, and it's all right there. Uh, it will have all of your calculated totals in it, and at the end will spit out a PDF version for you, or you can download it in like Excel or something. Uh, Joist is, is a good one for entry level to you kind of cut your teeth on a system, and it's free, <clears throat> uh, which I like even better. Um, but the next step up level, there's one called Clear Estimates, is another program. Uh, it's kind of the mid range. Uh, it's I think it's 60 bucks a month for the for the basic program. Has a few more bells and whistles uh, along with it. It's all online based, and it um, it gives you the customization. It has some more reporting functionality that you can take. Um, when you get up, Clear Estimates. Is Joyce spelled J-O-Y-S-T? J-O-I-S-T. I-S-T. On your plumbing uh, rehab cost, does that include gas? That is for, uh, you talking about running a new copper gas line? New gas. There, or galvanized. And how often do you have to replace gas? We don't do it very much, and I'll tell you why, because a lot of times we eradicate all the gas. We, we shift most of our properties over to all electric, um, purely preference. Um, if it has, I'll tell you when we keep it. We keep it if there's an existing unit that's a gas water heater or a gas um, furnace that's already, it's in good condition, it's relatively new, and it's already got gas hooked up to it, that's the only time that we will keep the gas. Um, some of the flip, I'll say the other time, is maybe if it's got a gas burning fireplace for a flip of that nature. It's the only time I keep it. Rentals, we get rid of all gas. Um, it's always going to be converted to all electric. What about a wood burning fireplace? Hate them. I know. What do you do with that? Board it up. <laughs> <laughs> on a, I mean, on a rental, yeah. I mean, on a rental, you board it up. On a fix and flip, you're gonna, gonna, that's a selling feature. So 
So you're going to try to dress it up on a wood burning. Um, sometimes they will ask you, we, we've used that as a negotiating point sometimes, where when the, they come in, they go, oh, we love the fireplace, it's beautiful, we just wish it had a gas starter. All right, pay our price, I'll put a, a gas starter in. I mean, it's, those are negotiable items, it's just like a refrigerator. You know, we don't supply refrigerators, we use those as negotiating points. So you don't do gas logs, you don't do that? No, it's just, it's a, those, are, those are items that we leave open for negotiation. That's a good question. Um, it's either or. Most of your designers will tell you when they come in to stage your house, everything's for sale. So the norm is that no, they they leave and they come get you know once you go under contract, then after you get under contract, you just they go back in and take their stuff out. Um, but. We have had instances where come in, they come in and say, oh, well, I like that couch or that decoration, and they'll buy it. And we just factor it in to the sale of the price of the house. Hey, Jeff, um, i got a question for you. Yeah. Uh-oh. I like to come up here in the end. Jeff do a good job, by the way. <laughs> Great job, very thorough. Um, I have a question, because I wholesale a lot, and I know there's, who are my wholesalers again? Who is either wholesaler or wants to wholesale? Awesome. Um, when working with a wholesaler, um, we don't want to do all the stuff. I don't want to do all the stuff. That's too in depth. We're focused mainly on marketing, right? We're marketers, we want to get out there and try to find the property, hopefully you guys will buy, um, you know, some other buyers will buy. What should we do, the wholesaler do, because we're not going to go in here. You probably don't want our numbers anyway. What should we do to make sure we can get, get a property to you guys uh, the best way possible? Uh, you're right. You, you're not going to go through and prepare a full-blown scope of work and all of that. So I, we've gotten them before. We have people who will send us full-blown scopes of work. Is that a good thing or a bad thing that you've got them? It depends on who's sending it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, some are good, some are bad. But I will say this. As a wholesaler, if you're sending to your buyers, the most effective thing that you can do is maybe not have all of the numbers and the totals, but you need to be able to tell them the majors. You need to be able to tell them, this needs a new AC unit. This needs new flooring. This needs a new roof. They, um, you know, just look at those things and understand <clears throat> when it needs to be replaced versus when it can be repaired <clears throat> and make sure that your buyer knows those things up front because what you don't want to do is have a good relationship with someone who buys properties from you and you're trying to tweak the numbers a little bit so you might just leave out well you know that's questionable whether the ACs works or not just just close it up front we'll make the call when we get in there you know whether or not it does or doesn't need to be replaced but at least you've you've opened up that tent you built a relationship with that person to where it's open-ended and they understand that you're not trying to just push a property to them. So just the major, just make sure that you, you check out, make sure there's no structural HVAC, roofing, plumbing, electrical, those types of things. And I'm sure lots of pictures, potentially videos, all yes. those kinds of things are helpful. I said, I think it was maybe my first slide, what I said was take as many pictures as you possibly can. Uh, that helps obviously the person to review without having to go through and walk the entire property. They can go through more properties in a day. Um, when, when you've got someone who gets as many probably, I mean, you go through probably, what, 20 properties a day, uh, and there's no possible way that, that you can get a full scope on that. So the more pro the more pictures you provide, the better. Um, the other thing is, I had, a, I had a slide that said no video. I don't mean no video for your houses. Videos are great in what they're used for when you're putting that on YouTube or you're you know doing a marketing piece or something like that, but they have zero value for someone reviewing whether or not the AC needs to be replaced or the floors are bad or whatever. The problem with, with video is you gotta stop it and you gotta go back and you got and it just it takes forever. Pictures, I mean you can go right through them, it's a lot better. So they'll just don't do video to be able to sell to your rehabbers. Use your videos out as marketing material. Awesome. Any other questions for Jeff? Got a couple more maybe? I got one. Um in ground I uh, checked the property out last week. The 
bottom to knock out, so obviously fill it in. Yep. Ten grand. Everybody thinks that swimming pools are hard. Um, well, you know, you got two. You got above ground, you got below ground. Above ground, you just scrap it. Yeah, yeah, do that. That's, that's fine. Um, the in ground stuff, two to three thousand dollars to have someone come out and demo uh, a swimming pool. Just an average size. I mean, you're not talking about Olympic swimming pool or something, but just, just a regular, just a regular backyard swimming pool in ground, you know, two to three thousand dollars. It's mostly you're paying what you're paying for is bobcat time for that. They're going to fill in everything they can possibly fill in. They're going to haul off what they can, what the city doesn't let them put in. Jeff, with, with rising costs of, you know, just subcontractors, contractors, home builders, whatever it is, how realistic are the numbers that you just gave us that, that most of the people out here could actually go get those numbers? Uh, those numbers are really, I think they're right on. I mean, I pulled those numbers based off of some recent projects that we did, did some analysis. So they're pretty up to date. Um, but I will say this, and I said it earlier, it all depends on number one, the relationship you've had. Is it a new person? You know, are they a GC or are they just a sub you're hiring? I mean, there's just variables that I can't explain on a slide that that you have to take into consideration. If you've got a guy you've been working with for five years, you're obviously going to get a better rate than from the guy that you just call up off the white pages and say, I need you to come quote me on fixing my plumbing. So it's it's kind of subjective, but we all work in margins, right? I mean, if we can't hit our budget within our project, then we don't make any money, and so why be in the business? So you kind of have to look at it from the standpoint of I need to be as realistic and as conservative as possible. And it goes to your point of I need to have a backup. I need to put some fluff on the back end of that to make sure that I don't overshoot myself in case I have to negotiate with somebody new and have to pay a little bit more. That makes sense. Awesome, guys. Let's give Jeff one more round of applause. Yeah, appreciate you, Jeff.